Welcome to Florida Mint on Florida Man with Greg, Wayne, Josh, and Cameron, the podcast where Floridians discuss the legends, lore, and crazy stories. Ho, 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 you had a great Merry Christmas, Florida. Florida. Hey, Santa. He is good. He's stoned. He just kept going. He went this right is, through it. This is the first episode after our Christmas break. Yes. Uh-huh. We hope very you guys had good, a great. Very good Christmas. I had a lot of acting gigs. Let me tell you, I'm What did you out. do? Oh, Santa, obviously. Uh-huh. That's right. I heard that uh, you were doing a moonlighting gig as an actor for the Hallmark Channel. Uh, yeah, that was that one episode uh, where I broke up a family. Right. Uh, Be- Santa Claus becomes a lover. Uh, right. Oh, wow. Of yeah. the dad. Yep. A homewrecker. A gift of the Magi. A homewrecker. Yeah. That's the name of the episode. I didn't yeah. want to say it. <laughs> to- ho, ho, homewrecker. Because it has an air jet. But to, to clarify, uh, uh-huh. Josh is acting on the site. So congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. You guys will see him in some uh, upcoming films in 2020. So Ho, ho, homewrecker. Ho, ho, homewrecker. Amy um, Schumer's in it. Amy Schumer. <laughs> Oh, I'm pretty sure you signed an NDA, so I wouldn't oh, talk. Well, okay. I wouldn't yeah. say much more after Don't that. Say anything else? But what we didn't sign uh, is an agreement to not hear headlines, which means we're free hey, to hear headlines. So we are going to hear headlines. Yep, right we're now. We're definitely hearing headlines. Let's, let's, let's hear them. Let's hear it. <laughs> Okay, headlines. 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 That's what I came for. All right. So do you guys remember a couple months ago, uh-huh. uh, we were talking about Florida's new um, deputies that they have on campus to protect children. And Oh, yeah. Do you remember what happened? Battle yeah, ready. The guy sold his gear. Uh-huh. Um, pawned it. He, yeah, he pawned his... So uh, he could get it back, potentially. Right. Yes. Yeah, he pawned his gear, uh, which was his gun and his... <laughs> uh, his uh, uh, vest, bulletproof vest. Yep. Well, we have another one of those. No way. No way. So another Florida man. Well, it's Christmas. Right. Yes. How are, are you going to provide gifts for your own kids? That's true. Right. You got to think of your own kids sometimes. And during Christmas break, what do you not need? The the weapons and the armor that the government gives you. Thank you. Well, it's about to get more interesting. Oh, okay. Uh, so this Florida man uh, is a school resource officer that pawned his duty weapon <laughs> and he Ew. was caught carrying Ew. a... <laughs> I call I call my bidet a duty weapon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, oh god, that, that got gross. So he was caught carrying a pellet gun. What? Instead, instead of his regular instead gun. Instead of his like oh my yeah, standard gosh. issued Exactly. Oh my gosh. So basically Was it the orange tip that gave it away? Probably, yeah. <laughs> um so basically the, his supervisor stopped by this elementary school uh-huh. to check on him and do like a random check. Uh and he the supervisor found Leroy King, uh, who had a pellet gun in his holster instead of his regular service firearm. Okay. Um, How do you stop someone that's got, let's say, an AK or uh, MK-45? Or, right. Well, I'd say it takes probably like three, maybe four pellets to hurt. Yeah, like, you got to get in the you eyes, You got to get though. three or four pellets to one bullet. You have to have a really accurate shot, I think, yeah. like Josh was saying, to shoot him in the eyeball. But how, so when it, they're doing a gear check, he pulls it out of his holster and the um, the king, what's it, who was it checking it? Yeah, no, his, his name, the guy that, that uh, pawned his service weapon is called Leroy King. Leroy King. Yeah. And then like his king boss, Leroy, the boss King. cop goes, that's a, pe- that's a pellet gun. Yeah, basically. Yeah. How um, many excuses do you think he gave to not hand it over? Like, oh, no, the safety's off. You don't want to touch it. You don't want to check it. Well, yeah, that's what he said. He said he came up with several different stories about where his actual gun was. Okay. One of the kids stole it. (laughs) Yeah. One of the kids has it. It's in for service. Yeah. That's what the the original thought was. You know, the the supervisor, like, is, you know, is it a home? Right. Uh, is it wherever we, you know, at the place that we do it's target practice? It's all getting that kind a tune-up. Right. It's getting a tune-up. They get um, tune-ups, right? Open carry cam? Uh-huh. Yeah. Guns yeah, yeah, get yeah. tune-ups? Yeah, I tune mine all the time. <laughs> Um, so basically it, it comes out that he has pawned his gun and his ballistic vest oh my six, gosh. six times in oh my three God. months. Does that, now does that say something about it, hit the management of his personal finances or yeah, how abs- much people get paid? 
Well, the people that are well, being chosen to protect our children, resource officers, like mm-hmm. that's like that's their job. Yeah, to, be to a, protect to be a school guardian, like hundreds of children. And this bobo shows up with a life vest on and a pellet gun. <laughs> but so bro. basically, he put all these kids at risk. Uh, to do whatever I don't know. Yeah, like Josh says, I mean, you gotta is it because his finances nostril? are so yeah. messed up, or because he's not paid enough? I don't think it matters. I think that oh, right. Oh, because you accept the job, you know the pay. I you guess. know what's happening, right? Yeah, and you know that your job is to protect all these children, right? So I don't care what his excuses. I think oh, shame I corner for this guy. I think shame corner for Joey King is his name, right? Leroy, Leroy <laughs> King. Sorry, Joey King. Uh, yeah. If you're out there, you're thinking of Boss Joey Deputy, right? But I, what's odd is like. I, I pawning anything six times that just seems weird. Yeah, no. Like I pawned you're basically one thing, and it's it's not a comfortable experience. Well, it's like three months, so that's like, yeah, that's that's six paychecks for three months, Jeez. right? If you're getting paid every two, right? It's like every two weeks he's pawning this thing, and you know, and you know the pawn shop's going. I mean, honestly, like, is the pawn shop getting trouble for that? Why? No, because he wouldn't know. Uh, I guess it's don't true. They have a list of like state owned property guns. That's not how it works here. Uh, guns are uh, frustrating. We're Freak. not going to get into that, though. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to move on to the next headline <laughs> yeah. before Josh goes on at a tangent. <laughs> I'm not. I'm open carry, too. He is open carry. <laughs> yeah, pellet gun. So, I got good aim. <laughs> I get one up the nostril and you're done. Yeah. Uh, so, this Florida man, uh, he drinks two bottles of liquor. Okay. Joshua. Midori Sour. I love after it. His, uh, after a train hits his car. Say what? Okay, so when a train hits your car, yeah. it's tradition in North America. You pop one. You pop pop a couple bottles to celebrate. Exactly. Right. Because yeah. you're about to get a payday. You just uh-huh. got chosen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you won the insurance lottery. You did. Um, so this man, um, Danny White. Okay. He mm. was driving home from a liquor store. Okay. okay. Uh he turned on he, he was going to make a turn onto his yep. uh onto the street yep. and he got stuck on the tracks. And a train starts coming down the tracks. I don't right. know what type of car these people own that gets stuck on tracks. Yeah, it happens way too often. That is way weird. too often. That is weird. Um, so he's trying to flag down the train. He realizes the train's not slowing down. Once they must he grab not see out of him. his car. So he gets <laughs> <laughs> he gets out of his car, uh-huh. and the the train hits his car. And so uh, after the wreck, he goes into his uh, his car and grabs these bottle of li- uh, bottles of liquor right. and drains them. Yeah, uh, then they are at the crash scene. This is what he says, at least. And so officers show up. Okay, and he's this drunk. Is clever. Okay. And so he's he's drunk. He won't take a sobriety test. <laughs> okay. Um. Basically, the guy was just hammered and got his car stuck on uh-huh. a uh, train track. But here's the thing, though, and I'm not trying to side. What's his name again? I'm Danny. Uh, Danny Wyatt. Danny Wyatt. I'm not trying to side with him. I'm just saying that that's really clever. It's not the worst story. You can't it's, you can't prove that he didn't drink after getting hit by a well, train. And he said he like it was so emotional seeing his car get hit, and he was so scared for his life that he uh, he needed to, I think to I, take I one think back it's a little good. bit. I think he goes in the fame corner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no not shame in the tame corner. No shame no. corner for this guy. He goes in the fame corner. Good for you, Danny White. Yeah, <laughs> unless he was drunk when the train hit him. Yeah, then it's shame corner. Lame, shame. lame on the train conductor for not just stopping that. What's train. he doing? Right? Yeah, obviously he has one job. You just look forward. <laughs> Bingo. Yeah. And there's that button. I've seen trains. There's that red button that says stop. Yeah, and, you, or the cord. Or it's the cord. Well, that's that's just for the kiddos. He probably was in the kiddos. I think he was Beep. in the he was in the room before the captain's room where you shovel the coal into the. Uh-huh. Oh fire. gosh, yeah. And he, you have to stop shoveling coal, or that thing's going to continue forward. So he didn't see the car. Put that shovel. Tame down. corner. Yep. Or lame corner. Hey, fellas. Hey, hey Joshua. So uh, I had um, a business lunch. Right. So at this business lunch, I meet like, a co-worker's girlfriend. Right. Another co-worker's husband. Right. And uh, they're like, oh, you're the uh, you're the dog lover. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And uh, naturally, I would hope to be known as something other than that. Yeah. Because dog lover kind of has those negative. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Like you. Yeah. And that actually... Uh, I was able to correct their thoughts and be like, no, I'm the podcaster. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. That's, that's 
really embarrassing actually i know i didn't you say never it. open with that <laughs> so but it's that like a blogger me, i'm the blogger i don't say that that's for sure well, it was a correction from dog lover though yeah well <laughs> yeah yeah that's better so uh that made me think of nicknames right and terrible nicknames and i thought of uh because you know my parents are divorced right that made me think of one guy's nickname who ruined his life okay so a nickname ruined someone's life a nickname it, it easily ruined his life okay um summers it was the summer of eighth ninth grade okay uh during summertime i would spend those summers with my mom right Mm -hmm. so all year i'd spend with my dad summertime i'd go to my mom's right and so i had this different set of friends yeah yeah rich friends summer friends yeah and summer friends (laughs) keep friends and cheap friends yeah Yeah. keeps and cheaps (laughs) piles so uh uh two new boys moved in the neighborhood okay in the summer and uh it was uh Fat Matt. Okay. <laughs> and his brother Mike. Okay. Okay. So uh, me and Fat Matt were real good friends. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and just uh, body shape. Body shape yeah. is what brought us together. Sure. We both shopped in the husky section. Uh, our lack of physical activities. Uh-huh. And uh, so he was telling me uh, after our first year of getting real close, you know, they had their first year of school. I didn't see them. And then I come back and it's now it's Fat Matt and Psych Mike. Okay, so Mike was his brother. So Mike's got a nickname now. Mike was his stepbrother, who I didn't get along with. Mike was kind of like a um, very arrogant, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of a jerk, but a jerk to be like uh, cool in front of other people, right? And uh, apparently, what happened uh, over that school year, their first school year there in this small town where my mom lived, um, Psych Mike uh, asked a uh, the quiet girl, okay, to prom. Yeah. Okay. That's nice. Uh, and then uh, waited a couple weeks. Yeah. Let her get excited. No. Uh, and then psyched her. Oh, wait, oh what? no. Yeah. And, and I'm really surprised that Cam knows what this means. Right. Yeah. yeah because I, it's I never a, went to prom. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's a well, fr- uh, psych is a phrase where like us older gents oh, yeah. where you're faking people out. Like, yeah. I'm hey, not that young. Your hair looks good. <laughs> psych. 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 Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So psych Mike did this to a girl. Over prom, that's messed oh. up. For yeah. two weeks, yes. she thought he she was going to prom with him. Oh yeah, and, and he thought he 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 snickering. He thought yeah. this is going to kind of elevate his status right. into cool bike. Oh okay, but he was trying to leverage his position. This right. turned him into psych Mike. Right. Uh, little did he know that this young quiet girl in this very small town was kind of well connected. Okay. Right. Uh, and so much so that. He was kind of publicly shamed in the paper. What? For, for doing what he did to the girl? Yes. Good. It, it was almost like a gazette, like a newsletter. Sure, yeah. Uh, but it kind of named him. Right. Mm-hmm. Not last name, but everybody knew. Yeah, they, they knew what happened, knew who he was. And so this guy, uh, uh, relentlessly, and it was not like like a known, it was known what happened to her. Right. And known what he did. Right. But it was not like talked about like, okay, uh, every chance you get, you have to psych Mike. Uh, it was just okay. kind of like in the community where uh, if you saw this guy. You psyched him. You psyched him. Oh, my god! This guy like got un- psyched. Like, like an unspoken rule. Uh, yeah. He got psyched by, from what I'm told, from what Fat Matt told me, <laughs> he got psyched <laughs> on a daily basis. Right. I mean, teachers. His parents. Oh, God. His parents psyched him. Hey, baby, we love you. Psych. Yeah, we yeah. love you. Or or we got pizza, your favorite. No, we didn't. Psych. <laughs> Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Brussels sprouts for you. Uh, he got psyched at like the dentist's office. Oh, like, bro, my gosh. Uh, you're all clean. You don't have any cavities. Psych, you got two cavities. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Fat Matt told me it, it got like, he'd go to Blockbuster and he'd be like, do you have Pokemon Snap? And they'd be like, yeah, we got one copy left. <laughs> and then they'd be like, psych. And all hopes and dreams. Oh this turned this kid into like neurotic. Yeah, like, like full-time oh, PTSD. Yeah. Oh, like losing hair at like 12 years old because right. he had been, he couldn't trust anybody. He's being bullied by a whole town. And he was being, it was mental terrorism. But he's, but, but, yeah, but, he's, mental terrorism. but he started it. He started oh, yeah. on the sweet little girl. It's but revenge. It, it's, it, it's justified revenge. But I've never seen a town collectively but not like organizationally, right? Terrorize a human being, a bully, a boy. They came after a bully. Yeah, they came after a bully. The Avengers. I, <laughs> the Avengers. Did you say he went to church um, to receive communion? 
Yeah. And yep. the priest went Fat to go, Matt told me. Yeah, the priest went to go put it on his tongue and right before he touched it, he pulled it away and goes, like, Well he turned <laughs> he, he, he pulled it away and then pushed his thumb on his tongue. Yeah. Oh, and said psych. psych. He, squee- he squeezed his tongue. He squeezed it. <laughs> With pliers, <laughs> which is even weirder. Say you're sorry. Yeah. And then everybody in the church stood up, and it was the whole town. And, and then they <laughs> they walked towards him, and they punched him to death. Oh, psych, 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 psych. <laughs> but yeah, that story of Psych Mike and how nicknames can really hurt somebody. But it's justified. Hewlett Wheeler was born in 1901 in Christmas, Florida. 118 oh, years old. Christmas, Florida. That was last week. Yep, it was. And he would be 118 years old if he was still alive. Jackpot, Christmas town. That was a quick one. So he was named it's after here, the doctor who delivered him as a baby. Oh, Gaby, I think is the name. No. Baby. Well, no. <laughs> Gaby the baby. Yeah, so Hewlett is his first name. Oh. Um, but being named after the doctor who delivered you was actually a common custom back then. Okay, yeah, it's kind of strange. Was it but, an honor? Well, no, I think it's because childbirth was risky back then. Um, so, like, if... Now you know, it just flows. If you survive, the parents are like, hey, like, what an honor. Like, whatever your name is, we're naming our kid after you. You know what I, I mean? Like, sweet. You got to learn the doctor's name before you agree to it, though. Well, I, I mean, think... If, I, the, if it's a small town, how many Hewlett's you got running around? Yeah, I know. But I think back then the doctor <laughs> traveled. Oh, okay. And, and so it was like one of those things. You wow. wouldn't see him often. Oh, so. pie in your face. Oh. Uh, yeah, so basically... Uh, I, but it would make me second guess if uh-huh. I'm going to do, you know deliver um, my child's coming yep. and the doctor's name was like you Satan. Know, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or like Adolf. <laughs> Just, yeah, Adolf von Satan. This was yeah. in 1901. That wasn't a thing yet. Yeah, you're going to be like, hey, yeah. I don't want to... Uh, let's pick a different doctor. <laughs> uh, but Hewlett Wheeler um, was uh, born into a family of ranchers, actually. Oh. Uh, his parents, uh, James and Nora Wheeler, um, both worked as assistants on the ranch they were on until they were able to save up enough money to basically buy land and start their own ranch. Okay. That sounds nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Hugh was raised around animals and kind of living the cowboy life from a very young age. And so like in modern times, like I know it's kind of a fantasy for guys to want to be a cowboy growing up or oh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, but Hugh, pow, pow. this was Hugh's life. Like he was born into that. And so lucky. I know. Well, actually lucky compared to most guys that we talk about. I mean, uh, because you know, being around being born in this time, there's only a couple things you can be. Yeah. Like, cowboy, dead farmer, yeah. <laughs> doctor, <laughs> exactly. Pirate mailman. There you go. You named them all, actually. <laughs> uh, but as a toddler, he was taught how to feed and take care of the smaller animals. Uh-huh. And by the age of four, he was helping his father shoe the horses. Nice. So yeah, he shoe. Was, Go away, horses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think that's what it's meant. <laughs> Putting the, uh, the horseshoes on them. Uh-huh. Uh, so he was like... Uh, you really got to throw them right, though. You really got to throw the horseshoes oh, yeah. right to get them right, right onto on. their foot. Put <laughs> right right them right on there. Uh, he loved watching his parents do their day in and kind of day out responsibilities uh-huh. because he said they never missed an opportunity to teach him how to do it himself. Oh God! Yeah, so, bet. yeah. So hey, a, stop watching. Get over here. So yeah, every day was like a learning experience for this kid, and he was soaking it up. Um, like nice. one of his favorite things to do, actually, it's going to sound odd at first, uh-huh. was to watch his mother do the laundry. Okay. That is odd. Yes, yeah. that's, I'd call that odd. Yeah. Oh, this is when you had to go to the river though and beat it with a rock, kind of, sorta. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it was actually a very interesting process. Uh-huh. And so once the clothes were clean, uh, his mother Ida would run a hot iron over a block of beeswax. To help remove the wrinkles from the clothes. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, if I'm a rancher, right, in these times, yeah, the last thing I'm concerned about is wrinkles. Is wrinkles, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll get to that because it wasn't a fashion statement. Oh. Um, so basically, the process was like you would put a block of beeswax down. I love it, and then a layer of fabric that you didn't mind like messing out, like an old towel. Okay, and then the clothes that you wanted to smooth the wrinkles out of, you would put on top of that fabric, and then you would iron it. And what would happen was the beeswax would start to melt, and the wrinkles would kind of disappear. Like it was just it was okay. Just well, would it act like starch? Well, like the reason why, it? yeah, the reason why is because the materials used back then were like rugged and rough and burlap. So like when so you're kind of soften it up too, so that you could actually put them on. Okay, because oh they were like God. so thick oh, and so stiff, uh, like, right? It wasn't malleable, and the beeswax helped kind of make it to where you could wear these like clothes. Like dickies, yeah, and work Y'all in them worn exactly. Dickies before uh, there wasn't any fabric softeners back then, uh, so beeswax uh-huh. is what you had to use. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, so one day while Hugh was watching his mom do this, she tosses him a chunk of the melted beeswax. She was going to toss it aside. Yeah. Uh, but he asked her if he could play with it. And she was like, I guess. Yeah. Okay. And so she kind of just cuts it off and gives it to him. Nice. And so immediately he starts trying to shape it and kind of mold it. 
cute. Because it's hot and it's malleable. The beeswax, okay. Right. Yeah. And so at first he rolls it into a ball and then he rolls it as flat as, flat as he could. Uh-huh. Um, but eventually, uh, he said he sat in the corner of the room and he really focused on shaping it into something very specific. And so his mother, Ida, said within 20 minutes, uh, he had molded the beeswax into the shape of a horse. Oh, oh wow. Cute. And so she took it inside to show Hugh's father, James, because she said it was weirdly well done. Oh, she was going to cut the head off and then give it as a gift. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. Hang it on the wall. wall. <laughs> and so uh, she's quoted as saying, it didn't look like a horse in shape only, um, but also in its features with precision and excellence. Wow. That's okay. His, that's his mother's a loving mother. That's though. his mother's endorsement. Well, I yeah. think probably like the the big muscles and the in the legs. Mm-hmm. No, that's what I think that's what she was hinting at was that he was just it was he was really good. Very well defined. At, at shaping it right. And so but either way, Hugh's parents were so impressed that every day when it was time for laundry, Ooh. he was given the beeswax in order to shape it into something new and he freaking loved this. Like I, he was really good at it. I think I would love this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said he would do his chores extra fast and with great care so that he could be ready to go whenever it was laundry time. So this kid's getting up early, working yeah. super hard. And they're like, boy, I knew you've been you've been wussing out on us. Yeah, I know. You said you couldn't get them chores done any faster. And, and now you're doing it. And now he's just sitting around waiting for beeswax to toss at him. Now he's like, yeah, my chores done in 10 minutes. Yeah. So the thing is, he was like freakishly good at this, but he was only good at sculpting farm animals. That's, well, all that's, he, all he that's all he knows. That's all he knows. He's exposed to. So like sheeps, cows, chickens, but most importantly... Wrinkly shirts. Horses. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so horses were like his MO. That's what uh-huh. he would go to. He was really good at it. And so they would give these away as gifts to people who came through the ranch. Oh, what so a it was a, it was a popular, like kind of a well-done location. So when people came through to board their horses or to uh-huh. stay the night, when they would leave, they're like, hey, here's this kind of statue. Uh-huh. Our son made it out of uh, beeswax. Wow. And it would be like a, you know, a horse or whatnot. And so it sounds kind of crazy, but if you look up beeswax sculptures, like it actually looks like bronze when it's done. Whoa. Like it's, yeah, it's fascinating. Really? Uh, so luckily for Hugh, he's got like these amazing parents. And so as he gets older, he's still sculpting, but mm-hmm. like nothing much about his life has changed. So he, like, he hasn't stopped being a rancher yeah. in order to focus on. But now you they know, just got him on the assembly line. Yeah, they're just make, having to make gifts. <laughs> Handing him stacks of beeswax. Well, yeah, his parents actually ended up buying him some modeling clay oh. and a few tools. But for the most part, he just, it was a hobby. He kept doing what he was doing. Okay. And so when he was 17 years old uh, and he had finished high school, his parents kind of sit him down and they delivered some news that he never expected. Uh-oh. They had been secretly saving their money and had arranged for him to stay with friends in Ohio so that he could attend the Cleveland School of the Arts. Okay. Wow. Uh-huh. Wow. So this is like, Good uh, parents. this is prestigious, right? His life has changed forever. Mm-hmm. So he's gone from being this kind of rancher, kind of cowboy guy to, hey, like, we believe in you. You're going to this fancy art school in Ohio. Yeah. And Deep. so because he was a cowboy at heart, like that's all he's ever really known. And so up until this point, it's all he thought he ever would be. Okay. Right. Now it's cowboy moving here to big titties. <laughs> yeah. Well, now he's at this like prestigious school and it's sculpting on a whole nother level. So hopefully like he spent some time with, with the clay that they bought him. Yeah. yeah. Because I'm pretty sure they weren't using beeswax up in the, <laughs> up at the university. You never know. Uh, but in 1919, Hewlett Weaver arrived in Cleveland for his freshman year, uh-huh. uh, and he absolutely knocks it out of the park. Yeah, uh, People were blown away at the lifelikeness of his sculptures, mm-hmm. but there was still one small issue. He could only do farm animals still. Still? Okay. Oh, God. He's still just knocking the farm animals out of the yeah. park. And he's like, his teacher's like, another pig, seriously. <laughs> yeah. We're so tired I, of it. I call this banana. Yeah. On a wall. And they're like, <laughs> and that's never going to fly. They're like, they're like, that's a horse. <laughs> uh, so here he is at the super fancy art school, and he's yeah. the guy turning in horses every day. Jeez. You know, like uh, sheep or whatever. You remember the girls in high school that could only draw horses? No, I know. Horse oh, girls. Yeah, horse girls. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Annoying. So the catch is, though, he was so good that even though his professors kept trying to move him away from farm animals, they couldn't deny the fact that he was one of the best sculptors they had ever seen. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Um, you look at this octopus. Don't you want to do an octopus? <laughs> he's like, here's a horse. He's like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> he's like I'll try to do the octopus like I, I just imagined him like trying to do something else eight legged horse <laughs> it's yeah. always a horse <laughs> every time <laughs> so even though his style was kind of out of the ordinary uh, during his second school year uh-huh. uh, in Cleveland uh, Hewlett Wheeler was recommended by all of his professors to attend uh, an advanced program study oh. in Paris France nice whoa uh, keep in mind this guy's still just doing farm animals yeah <laughs> and so he's decided at this point like this is like his career and I'm going to do what I do best. I'm sticking to it. I think at that point I would. Yeah. like I I, I bet, I'll be the horse guy. Yeah, exactly. Right? I'll be the horse lover. Right. So when he arrives in Paris, like he's the stereotypical 
American cowboy. Hey there, buddies. Yeah, he shows up in Paris <laughs> like with his hat on, all the super stuff. What's right? Cameron's uh, a French accent? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, it's the horses. <laughs> there you go. See, <laughs> spot on, man. That's dead really ringer. good. Dead ring. That's really good. Uh, so basically, like. If he didn't stick out like a sore thumb in Cleveland, yeah. he's definitely sticking out now in Paris. Oh, yeah, for sure. But yeah. because it's like so extreme, yeah. Like, and he, he's just like overall, he's super nice, uh, really good, like, he has an awesome character. Mm-hmm. People just loved him and they thought it was some kind of like avant garde type thing. Okay. Like, they didn't see it as like some like hillbilly, whatever. They yeah. were like, man, have you heard about the guy that only sculpts horses? Yeah. Like, it was like his thing. He loves freaking horses. Yeah. <laughs> so Paris like turned him into like this like speciality. Yeah. Right. He's the guy. And so um, he's also making a lot of money doing it because rich people, um, they love polo. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, which is a game played on horseback. I have to admit, in my house, in my four-story house. There you go. Josh knows about this. We had all of these paintings, and it 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 would all, they would all show either, like, a fox hunt. Right. Yeah. Or freaking polo. Right. And they were so boring to I know. look at. But they were all wearing, like, freaking long jackets. They're yep. all on horse. Yep. And they're terribly boring, but they were all from that. That that is crazy. That's one hundred percent right. And so he would approach these families who were wealthy yeah. and into that kind of stuff, and go, "Wouldn't you like a statue of your prize pony?" God, I yeah. bet they would love that. Not, the, not the person on top of the pony. I can't do the person. No, just no. the pony. One hundred percent. It could they be would, a horse on a horse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, well, they, they paid him huge bucks for this. Like oh, yeah. this was like a thing. And so he was making money, and he was extremely specific. He this is what he did very well. Yep. And so, uh, and when he's in Paris. They actually teach him how to sculpt humans. Whoa. And this is how you know he's like a true artist. No more horse on horse. He excelled at it. Oh, really? Okay. He just didn't like doing it. Yeah. So he was like, he, he was doing so well at sculpting humans and sculpting other things. But in his free time, he was like, I just freaking love fire animals, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, like, People I don't. are boring when you can do a horse. Yeah. But, but, that's how, but, that's, but that's how you know, though, like whenever, like you're a good artist, whenever someone can go. Hey, but can you do this? Yeah. yeah. And, he, and he does it. And then he's like, but I don't want to do it anymore. I want to go the other way. I mean, with his hands. Right. Mm. So during this time in American history, um, we're in the Great Depression. Okay. Mm-hmm. And things are really bad. And there's not a lot of things uh, going around that could really cheer people up. Uh, but there was one sport um, besides baseball that was really taking off. And it was horse races. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Right. People love betting. Butter. Right. Uh, so it didn't matter where you came from or how much money you had. Yeah. The races were a place where everyone could kind of gather and just forget about like how bad things were. Like even if it was temporary. Okay. Uh, and there was one horse who was like the New York Yankee of horses. And his name was War Admiral. Um, and he was literally called. This is uh, this is true. The greatest horse of all time. Okay, sub. So his sub name mm-hmm. it was War Admiral, the greatest horse of all time. Literally, <laughs> that's his name. Jeez, uh, he uh, had uh, won the Triple Crown, oh, which is basically whoa. like the Super Bowl of horse races. Uh, yeah, the Super Bowl. Of yeah, horse races. and he hadn't lost a race in as long as anyone could remember. This is like what? this is like the most like the king of horses. Does um, he have guns strapped to him? Right, he's, he's just huge. All these- <laughs> just a muscular horse. Uh, but also coming up the ranks uh, around the same time was a smaller. And he's described as kind of sleepy. Mm. <laughs> a smaller, been described that way. smaller and kind of sleepy horse who was also <laughs> kind of bow-legged. Oh, wow. Uh, and he had lost five times more races than he had won. And his name was Seabiscuit. Okay. Oh, the biscuit. But you don't want to sculpt that horse. Huh? Right. Bow-legged horse. So Seabiscuit was the ultimate underdog going up against War Admiral, who was a legend. I wouldn't bet on Seabiscuit. And the crazy thing was that people who were kind of poor and underprivileged, they were rallying nationally around Seabiscuit. What? Because they saw him as this like underdog kind of mm, like, you their know. Their class. Right, yeah. exactly. And it was like their representative. Yeah. And so as fates would have it, Seabiscuit ends up racing War Admiral what? A, in what was known as the greatest horse race of, of all time. This is the legendary horse race. Horse and the greatest horse race right. of all time. And Seabiscuit beats him. What the, nice. what the H is a Seabiscuit anyways? Right. Going uh, up against a War Admiral. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that, I think that's kind of the thing is this horse was so like forgotten that he was like traded and sold to all these different companies before this guy finally buys him and goes like, I don't know, I kind of believe in him. And and, and he has the worst name. What I know. Is, so, and he beats War Admiral? So Seabiscuit defeats War Admiral, right? Does War Admiral trip and fall? No, he just beats him outright. Oh my God. But so now the scrawny horse is like a living legend. <laughs> And so all these important people, because keep in mind, horse races are a huge deal. Oh, yeah. All these very important, very rich people are kind of hanging around after the race. And the governor of California goes, 
we need to immortalize Sea Biscuit. Oh my gosh! Uh, in a way that he, like this memory, this moment mm-hmm. is never forgotten. Yeah. And present there is a San Francisco art dealer who goes. Actually, I've got friends in Paris who has told me about a guy. <laughs> Holy who, crap! This is what he does. Holy crap! So Hewlett Wheeler was contacted no. and obviously jumps on the opportunity. And in February of 1941, Hughes' life-size monument of Seabiscuit was unveiled at the Santa Anita Stadium in Arcadia, California. Unreal. So now the guy who only wanted to sculpt horses has become a legend for only sculpting horses. Uh-huh. Uh, Hewlett Wheeler went on to have works displayed all around the world. He became a household name in artistic communities. Um, and to this day, he has permanent exhibits in New York, California, Ohio, Paris, and most importantly, Florida. Showing what? Uh, horses. Okay, man, baby. <laughs> uh, yeah, literally. Uh, just horse sculptures. Just horse sculptures. Yeah. Uh, in Hugh's last interview, um, he actually said, a piece of sculpture should be so good and so realistic that it will rouse the best feelings in a person. Okay. That's why I think it's a mistake to keep on working on things when you know you've done your best. As with many things, an artist's most important skill is knowing when to stop. Mm-hmm. Wow. This is true. Yeah. yeah true. And so when Hugh was asked what he thought about this like kind of newfound fame and being world famous as a sculptor, uh-huh. he said, all those words said about me aren't me. I'm not oh. an artist. The only thing I know is how to be a cowboy and that I love horses. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> yeah. He's a simple man. So yeah. this guy goes on to be a world renowned artist, famous sculptor, and uh, someone that like rich people kind of idolize. Yeah. And, and he's, he's just, just a good like, old fashioned cowboy who yeah. loves and, like he, he he literally just said like, this is all I've really known how to do. This, that's unreal. And it just happened at the exact same time as this legendary horse race. Like, it was the perfect place, perfect it, time. Like, it seemed what like a time to be alive. What a time, what a time to, to be alive. Everything lined up for this guy. Oh, there yeah. are people who said that Hewlett Wheeler was responsible for kind of like symbolizing with that statue um, how people felt during the Great Depression having that moment of joy. Like, wow. that, that race was like something that pulled them out of their sadness, out of their funk. And, hope. and, they're, and, they're, and he was responsible for the hope that it gave. So. From yeah. Florida. From a Christmas, Florida. From Florida. The guy born in a small town that is Christmas year round. This when blows my mind. Was a famous horse culture. So yeah, it's been a great week. It's yeah, been an awesome Fantastic week. Fantastic week. week. Uh, we love you guys writing in. We hope you had a great holiday season. Thank you so much for interacting on our social media, which is yes. FMOFM Podcast. Uh, thank you for your donations, um, both love donations and hate donations mm-hmm. on the front page of FMOFM.com. Uh, we love you guys and we hope you have a fantastic week and we'll see you soon. Psych!